Well, he hello everyone and good morning. Uh, I'm glad uh, to be gathered with you all this morning, whether in person or uh, online. It's uh, really nice that even though we've moved to Code Orange, and I'm sure that's on everyone's minds, that we can at least still uh, meet together in this place or even online. Um, I'm just really thankful that we can do that together. Uh, so if you're new, um, particularly if you're listening online and don't know me, my name is Nathan Drover, and I'm one of the pastors here, uh, along with uh, Sheila and Andrew, who uh, do various other things as well. And um, yeah, so before we get into the service today, I just want to give you a brief update on some of the COVID guidelines, because as we've moved into this new orange phase, we do have some different uh, guidelines that we have to abide by. So the first, though, um, this is one that we've always had, which is unless you are on stage alone, uh, you do have to wear a mask at all times. And this includes even in the parking lot now with Code Orange. Uh, so that's always been part of our operational plan. But I just want to emphasize that even when you're leaving your car and coming, going back to your car, you now have to wear the masks. Um, as well, this is probably the biggest change for the one that we'll feel the most. It's the one I'll feel the most, uh, but we're not allowed to sing anymore as a congregation. So singing, one person singing and performing from up front is still permitted, um, but unfortunately, we're not allowed to sing as a group together. So the lyrics will still be up front um, on the screen, but if you're here in person, unfortunately, we ask you not to sing. Uh, if you're at home, though, you can sing all you want. So that's one advantage of uh, staying home and then tuning in online. But I'm also, you know, if you're here, I'm glad you're here. Uh, as well, um, just as another thing, we can now only be seated uh, within our household bubbles. So there's no extended bubbles anymore. Um, so the ushers will uh, guide you as, as that work, uh, you know, to make sure you're all socially distanced and everything like that. Um, so you're good there, but that also means that there's no physical contact allowed for people outside of your bubble. So just as a reminder there that we uh, unfortunately can't hug or handshake or anything like that, those who aren't already in our bubbles. So just as a reminder to why we do all of this, because it is, it is annoying. Like I, I know I feel frustrated, I feel annoyed, I feel tired, I'm ready for this to be over. Um, but we, we do this for two reasons. One is to love those around us who are, if you're not at risk, uh, there are people in this congregation who are at risk. And so we just thank you for your willingness to love them and protect them by keeping these guidelines. And as well, we want to move out of code orange back into code yellow. And then eventually, I think there's a code green in the future somewhere, hopefully. And so we keep these guidelines now so that we can more quickly get into code yellow and then uh, hopefully eventually code green. So of course, as we go through this Sunday uh, service, uh, it's going to feel a little bit different. Uh, we have, um, you know, these new limitations and new restrictions, and so we're probably going to feel more limited and restricted than normal. But these limitations and restrictions shouldn't take away from our hope. You're going to see that hope is really the theme this morning. In fact, Paul writes in his letter to the Romans that this should actually increase our hope, which is a weird thing uh, for us to think about. But let me read what he says in the first five uh, verses of that chapter. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and that perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. So this morning, let us approach the one sovereign God with hope that does not disappoint us. Uh, let us pray together. Father, I thank you that even though we have these restrictions, even though we have these limitations to um, keep us and others safe, 
that we are still able to come and worship you, that uh, even though we can't sing, um, our hearts can still be reoriented towards you, that we can still recognize your lordship and lay our crowns down before you. I pray this morning that you would fill this place with your Holy Spirit, that you would meet each one of us where we need to be met. Uh, I pray that uh, you would reveal your love to us and give us an enduring hope that will help us uh, to persevere through these difficult sufferings. In Jesus' name, by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray for all of these things. Amen. Well, hello and welcome everyone. Um, I know as we enter into worship, um, this has been an interesting week for most of us, probably, uh, probably a hard week for a lot of us. And as I was preparing for worship in kind of this different way, um, it was hard not to think that I actually was so happy that this crazy week falls on the first week of Advent because I thought during this time when so many of us are probably feeling nervous or frustrated um, or scared even, and when we're feeling the loss of things, like the loss of Christmas activities and being able to meet with family, what better time to pause and get to reflect on that greatest gift that we've ever been given, the Christmas gift um, that the pandemic can't take away, uh, the gift of Emmanuel, of God with us through all of it. Um, and I just thought, I'm so glad that you're here to still worship with us, whether it's online or whether you're here in person, because we can still worship. Because um, ultimately, worship is recognizing who God is. It's remembering that gift, remembering his love for us, and then we get to show our love for him back through what we do. And I think we can find the joy in Christmas, um, even through a pandemic, if we can do that. And we don't need to sing to be able to do that. So I'm actually going to invite you to stand, um, even though you cannot sing. Um, because I'm going to invite you to clap along or uh, bounce along. That tends to be what I do. Uh, <laughs> dance along if you feel so inspired. Um, or simply just kind of reflect along as we tell this story um, of the greatest gift. And uh, yeah, I'm going to bring the fiddle and try to spice up. Have, we'll have a worship party even when we can't sing. <laughs> Nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. In Bethlehem in Israel, this blessed babe was born and laid within a manger upon this blessed morn. The witch's mother Mary did nothing take in scorn. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. shepherds brought tidings of the same how that in Bethlehem was born the son of God by name oh tidings of comfort and joy comfort and joy oh tidings of comfort and joy
The shepherds at those tidings rejoiced with much in mind and left their flocks of feeding in tempest, storm, and wind and went to Bethlehem straightway the Son of God to find. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Child of Christmas, all others doth deface. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. It's a good thing that at least one of us remembers the order of service. That's why half the brain, a full brain. Anyway, um, if Anita and Jean wouldn't mind coming up and doing a scripture reading and a lighting of the Advent candle, and yes, you can all be seated. The first week of Advent is hope. As we draw closer and closer to Christmas, we enter to the season of Advent, just like a child who eagerly anticipates their presence of Christmas morning. During Advent, we also anticipate our presence. We anticipate the coming of our Savior and King Jesus Christ. On the first Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of hope. Long before Jesus came, God had given the people of Israel promises that gave birth to hope. These promises include the promise of a day when God would come to his people and save them. So for hundreds of years, the people of Israel waited with great hope for God to fulfill these promises. One of these promises can be found in Isaiah 7:14. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. The word Emmanuel means God with us. The hope that his promise generated was not wishful thinking. It was fulfilled in the birth of Jesus Christ. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. God demonstrated in Jesus that he is faithful to his promises. So we can also have hope in God's promises because he is the same God who continues to be with us today. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of your son Jesus, who was not only the hope of Israel thousands of years ago, but our hope of salvation today and our hope for tomorrow. Help us to share the hope of Jesus this Christmas season. Amen. So for this next song, you can stay seated if you'd like to, or if you feel like you need a moment to stretch your legs in the service, you are also welcome to stand. Um, we're going to sing an old Christmas hymn called O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, that I just wanted to take a minute to explain. So this hymn is actually told from the perspective of Israel during the time that we just heard about. Um, so the time when Israel was in exile. So they were oppressed by a Roman government. They were a suffering people. And they were longing for the promised savior, the promise that we just heard that God would send to save them. 
And I think it would be easy for us to sing this hymn and think that this doesn't apply to us, this is a story about Israel. Um, but I think we might be more alike to the Jews than we might think, especially in a pandemic. So this pandemic, in a way, um, is kind of like an exile. We've lost a lot of the things that are normal to us. We're not able to worship in the same ways. We're constantly adapting to a different life, just like they, the Jews were when they were in exile. So um, we're living in a broken world, and we are also waiting for our promise to come true, for our Savior to come. And so as we sing this song, I would invite you to feel what the Jews were feeling in this song. So feel that loss and feel the exile. Um, feel the brokenness and long for that Savior like they were. Um, and rejoice that just as God fulfilled his promise to them, he will fulfill his promise to us as well. And Jesus is coming. Turn our darkness into light. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee. Sin. 
morning, everyone. Welcome to all those who are here this morning in Facebook land. Uh, we don't have much this coming week for anniversaries or birthdays. We have one on Saturday the 5th, Ethan Mowbray birthday. So happy birthday to him coming up next Saturday. We have new uh, calendars that are out here for those people that are here, and those that will get posted on the Facebook page today or tomorrow. Before I get into announcements, uh, I just want to uh, send out a thank you to Michael Mann. I know we've kind of mentioned a little bit in the past, but uh, a little extra mentioning this morning. Um, Michael's done a lot. Like, if you go back to March when this all started, and if you weren't part of setting up the outdoor service, you have no appreciation for what went into it. So a lot of leg work, a lot of manual labor, a lot of Michael bossing us around saying, no, that doesn't go there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, a lot of work. Thank we're thankfully, we're inside now. And it's a little easier, um, as long as everything works back there. But we were able to update s some things, and he's helped us along the way. Um, on be the elders on behalf of the church gave him a small gift of appreciation yesterday. We couldn't give him enough for what he's done, so, <laughs> so that's neither here nor there. But we appreciate, Michael, everything that you've done. Um, pretty sure Cat doesn't make you do it. Pre I, you're pretty independent. <laughs> But I appreciate his uh, efforts of love for doing that. I mean, that's in his wheelhouse. That's part of it's his career, part of it's his, his hobby. So he's really good at it. He's kind of the tech lead, and he trains the other ones. We've got a great tech team with him and Taylor and Josh and uh, Nam this noon. So thank you for, I don't know if he wants to come out or if he put a hand in front of the camera. No one at home can ever see you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, on to announcements, uh, and I'm going to kind of reverse it because I want to do one thing last, and I'll probably forget. Uh, if anybody has ever has heard yet or not, but Wayne Forbes has uh, stepped down from the elders uh, board. Um, he was kind of only staying on until Nathan kind of got started and, and whatnot, but due to some health issues that everyone knows that he's kind of dealing with him and Sue, so he stepped down, and we just want to pray for Wayne. We thank him for his service over the years and for his wisdom and He's always around greeting people. He can't do that right now. I'm sure he was frustrated over COVID, not being able to shake hands and meet people like he's always used to. And we thank you, Wayne, if you're home there watching. And, uh, and I'm sure part of your ministry won't change anyway, so just because you're not on the elder board. So thank you very much, Wayne. Um, yeah. Uh, we also had to, the elders uh, had to uh, create a internship committee for Nathan. Um, Nathan's mentor is Mike Palmer and is that what's the right word? Yeah, Mike Palmer, Supervisor Mike Palmer in Florenceville um, through, his, through his work. So we had to do, come up with an internship committee that would meet with Mike and kind of review or give feedback, I guess, how well Nathan's doing, which he's doing very well. So just to let the church know, uh, it's Ron and myself, uh, Julie Brayson, Charlotte Dove, and Christina Menza just kind of a cross-section of people who have see, sees him in different parts of the ministry. So we'll only meet like three times of the year. So just want to let the church know that. I might need my glasses for this side. Uh, no river group today. Youth group will not be meeting either for the next few weeks due to the orange phase of recovery, just to see if things will settle down for that to make life a little more easier. Um, just a note, anyone who has receipts for church expenses are asked to submit them to Travis Adams by Sunday, December the 13th, so that they can be processed for this year and receipt it for 2020. So try to get those in. Uh, manuscript Bible study continues Monday, December 7th, first Monday of the month, 7 to 9 p.m. online via Zoom. That one, we just had one in person. Nathan continues to do his Facebook live updates every Thursday at 1.30 uh, groups tomorrow, Sheila's group continues to meet with the ladies at noon. Uh, Wednesday will be grief share, and that's going well. And thank the ladies for doing that on behalf of all those who uh, are meeting for that. Uh, Thursday, my care group at 7. That'll be our last one until the new year. And Mary Ann's will be Friday, December 4th uh, via Zoom at 10 a.m. Are you continuing? Or? Another week or so. Okay, yeah. perfect. And, yeah. We're excited to have Sheila preach with us, preach this morning and listen to her message. And I think that is it. Before going to the last thing, anybody that have anything that I may have missed? Okay, so obviously, well, next Sunday actually is Food Bank Sunday. We don't have it here, but that'll be coming up. We'll, we'll, we'll share some information on that this week and post that on Facebook. I do want to remember that. Um, 
pressed, I pressed myself for remembering. Uh, mission of the month today is Harvest House. Thank you so much for Harvest House and the work Aaron's doing up there in Plaster Rock and surrounding areas. Um, if you're able to give to Harvest House, please do so through the giving offering options, as you see there, through the church. And we have a video, and I'll let the video play, and then Sheila can come and give us a message. Thank you. started. Hello friends. I want to say hi and wish you all a Merry Christmas from uh, my family. We miss you all and I want to wish you a Merry Christmas from the Harvest House family. And uh, it's been a while since I've made any contact with most of you uh, but we're still we're still going strong here at Harvest House Toby. Uh, of course this has been anything but a normal year for us as it has been for you and uh, but we've been able to do all of our essential services and uh, what I want to show you is, uh, for those who have seen it, you're going to go, wow, what a difference um, in the renovations that we've done this year upstairs. We want to just, uh, I want to let you know that your prayer, your support financially and physically has been uh, essential to us. We've just really appreciated it and um, keep, keep going, keep in the faith, keep strong. I want to just give you a walkthrough uh, of our upstairs and... Uh, so I'm going to walk behind the camera here and walk you through, and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll enjoy what you see. Thank you. So yeah, this is our meeting room for our um, Saturday night fellowship service. As you can see, we can only fit about 10 people in here doing social distancing. That's okay because we never have huge numbers here anyway. Um, and there used to be a wall right here, as you can see on the floor. That used to be a wall, a hallway. We took that out, and it really made our room pretty much bigger. And then this used to just be a solid wall, and we put the serving counter in through there. And it's pretty nice. There's our uh, entryway from upstairs, our sign-in book, hand cleaners and all that good stuff. And then in here we have our kitchen, and uh, it is very spacious, uh, very, very uh nice for our kitchen volunteers and staff and they really really have been happy with it we thank la forest industries and gray rock construction uh, for helping us get this done kirk pearson engineering also and uh, just a walk around here and this uh, wonderful island here so yeah nice little bathroom there for the kitchen staff and um, that's that's it. That's our new renovation. And we're very happy with it. And, and we get to use it daily. So again, just want to say thank you so much for your prayers and continued support. May God richly bless you and keep you safe. And uh, I'm just going to sign off. Love you all. Bye-bye. Good morning. Um, for those of you at home, I'm Sheila Cummings, I'm the lay pastor here at the church. And um, this morning, we're thinking about hope and promises. And the first candle on the Advent wreath is called the candle of hope. But it's not also known as the prophecy candle. Um, and today, we're looking at the candle of hope on this first Sunday of Advent. And you know, I love the assurance, I love the hope that God, who fulfilled the promise that he declared in the Old Testament about Jesus, will also fulfill the promises that he's made to us and to others around the world. And our scripture reading is not in Luke or Matthew, that you think it's in Romans, and it's Romans chapter 15, verses eight to 13 and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. In verse eight, remember that Christ came as a servant to the Jews to show that God is true to the promises he made to their ancestors. He also came so that the Gentiles might give glory to God for his mercies to them. That is what the Psalmist meant when he wrote 
For this I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing praises to your name. And in another place it is written, Rejoice with his people, you Gentiles. And yet again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Praise him, all the people of the earth. And in another place, Isaiah said, The heir to David's throne will come, and he will rule over the Gentiles. They will place their hope in him. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So first thought is hope and promises that are made. And of course, the first question I had to ask myself is, what is hope? So of course, you go to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and they say that hope is to cherish a desire with anticipation, to want something to happen to be true. Now, as Christians, we can often confuse the word um, hope with wishful thinking. If we hope something will happen, we have no control over whether or not it'll take place. And you know, all of us are used to making promises, and we've probably made a lot of promises in our life. But we're accustomed to seeing promises either being kept, but quite often broken. Anyone who's lived any number of years would certainly um, lay claim to the fact that they've made many promises and haven't been able to keep every one of them. There are many reasons why this is true, but sometimes we forget. And sometimes something else happens that causes it not to happen. Some, these things happen, it's out of our control. Now as a child, I used to, along with my brothers and sisters, get the wish book, the Sears catalog, every Christmas time. And our family wore through several of them. I know Grammy and different ones kept them for us because we looked through them and we dreamed about the things we'd have. And you know, sometimes you'd circle things on the page hoping that somebody would, um, would do something for you. Well, and they would get it. Did we get what we circled and all those things on there? Usually not, um, but It was still that magical time before Christmas that we could look at it. And when Christmas morning came, we were excited about the things we got anyway, even if they weren't the things that were on there. Um, Did it stop us when we didn't get it each year? Did it stop us from doing that the next year? No. Every year we did the same thing. Now today, kids don't do it that way. They go on Amazon and they prepare an Amazon wish list. And they put their wish list together and quite often they send it to grandparents and things so that you can uh, look through and see what you might get them. So that's what, and the hope is that they might get it. But biblical hope is very different. Christian hope is when God has promised that something is going to happen and you put your trust in that promise. Christian hope is a confidence that something will come to pass because God has promised it will come to pass. How do we build our hope in God? Well, hope is really part of our faith, isn't it? Hope in the Bible exists as a secure assurance, a strong and confident expectation, a trust placed in a trustworthy God. God has not failed us in the past, and therefore, if he claims he'll do something in the future, we can have hope that that will come to, that will be fulfilled. Now, as I think about the children of Israel, I'm reminded of their years of hope for the Messiah. They wandered in the desert for years. All these things, they had a hope for a Messiah. And the Old Testament is full of promises of God's plan to redeem his people and restore them into a relationship with him. Now, many generations of Israelites lived and died, and they never saw that hope fulfilled but they continue to hope for the Messiah to come and to save them from their enemies and ultimately to save them from their sin. And finally, that hope was fulfilled. And as the song today, O come, O come, Emmanuel, how many times 
did the people of Israel say that? So the Christmas story, I think, is a perfect reminder for us that the promises that God makes, he keeps them. Now, many prophets throughout history shared that God's will, what God's uh, promises were about the coming Messiah. And with the birth and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, those promises were fulfilled. So as we begin this Advent season, it's important, I think, to take a little bit of time to remember that all the prophecies about the coming Messiah were fulfilled. In Romans 15.8, he said, uh, as written to the, this letter written to the Romans, remember that Christ came as a servant to the Jews to show that God is true to the promises he made to their ancestors. And there are so many promises about the birth of Jesus, and all those promises were fulfilled. So we're just going to take a moment and look at just a few of them. We'd be here all day, we're going to go through all the promises. The first promise I think of is a child will be born. In Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, it says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Who accomplished that? God. And it was fulfilled. If you look in Luke 1, 32 and 33, and Luke 3, 23 and 28, Matthew 1, 6 and 7, the child was born. A promise was kept. Then there's the second promise along this idea, a virgin birth of a child named Emmanuel. Is Isaiah 7, 14 says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And that's fulfilled in Matthew 1, 20 to 25 and in Luke 1, 26 to 35. When Mary, a young virgin, betrothed to a man named Joseph, was visited by an angel and told, and they told her that she would become the mother of God's son. Now at first she questioned it, as we all would, because she was a virgin, but she accepted it. And what did she say? Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And then there was Joseph. He was the other part of that <laughs> dynamic. And when he learned about this child that was coming, he planned to divorce her quietly. But again, an angel appeared to him in a dream and told him that the child was conceived of the Holy Spirit and that his name would be Emmanuel. We're told in Matthew 1, 24 and 25 that he did as the angel commanded. Promise, a virgin birth named Emmanuel. Promise kept. Now the next three that I'm pointing out are related to um, the genealogy of Christ. The next, he was a descendant of Abraham in uh, Genesis 22:18. And through your offspring, all nations of the earth will be blessed. He was a descendant of Jacob. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. Numbers 24 and 17. He was a descendant of David and would establish the eternal kingdom. In 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He's the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And it's fulfilled in Matthew 1, 17, uh, 1 to 17, Luke, 2, um, in Luke 3 and 23 to 38. We see the genealogy, and we see it down there. Now, the Jewish people... That was very important, the lineage of someone. And he, being able to trace Jesus back through David, through Jacob, to Abraham, gave it validity that he was 
fulfilling these promises. Now, if you live in rural New Brunswick, genealogy is pretty important too. When you meet somebody new, what are some of the first questions we ask? Well, who are your parents? Who were your grandparents? Who were, and that seems to be very important to us. It was important to them. It's important to us to know where somebody comes from. So he came and he fulfilled all those prophecies. The most important one, I think, is born in Bethlehem. It might be not the most important, but I think it's really neat the way it happened. In Micah 5, 2, it says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Egypt, whose going forth hath been from of old, from everlasting. Now in Luke 2, 1 to 7, in Matthew 1, 2, uh, 2 verses 1 to 6, and in John 7, 42, noted that it took, it, it not, wasn't just a chance, you know, and something didn't happen, oh well, this Jewish girl happened to be there living in Bethlehem, and she's going to have this child. No. It took a special decree from Caesar Augustus for a census to be taken, and they hadn't had a census in a long, long time. But because of that, Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem for the birth of Jesus. They didn't plan to have a birth there, but that's what happened. A secular ruler made a decree that caused a couple to be in Bethlehem who wouldn't have been there any other reason, and therefore, it fulfilled a prophecy about the location of his birth. Now, these are just a few of the prophecies about his birth. There's many more, but the point I wanted to make is when God makes a promise, he keeps that promise. So what does that mean to us in Perth Andover this Advent season of 2020? Just like God loved the children of Israel throughout their disobedience, even when they refused to obey him and refused to follow him, just like he loved them, he loves us. He forgave them time and time again, and ultimately, he provided the Messiah to redeem them. In the same way, he sent Jesus Messiah to redeem us. He forgives us time and time again. Every time I mess up and I ask him for forgiveness, what does he do? He forgives me. So I say that there's hope today and forever, and we have ongoing promises from God. Look at verse 9 in Romans 15. He also came so that the Gentiles might give glory to God for his mercies to them. Most of us are not of Jewish heritage in here, but we can hope in God and give glory to God for the mercy he shows to us. So I want to look at a couple of prophecies or promises that God has given us. And the promise number one is that God loves you unconditionally. Now we live in a sinful world where love and relationships are often uh, conditional. I'll love you if you, or I don't love you because you. Sometimes, even those closest to us let us down. But for most of us, our greatest need is to be loved unconditionally. We want a perfect, sacrificial, forever kind of love. We can't find it in human beings. We want to be supported and inspired by that love to not only become better people, but to love the people around us. And God is the only one who can provide us with that. Paul wrote in Romans 8, 38 and 39, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing separates us from God's love, unconditional love. Promise number two, God has redeemed you and has prepared a home for you. Now we've been blessed with the promise of heaven through faith in Jesus Christ. It's by his blood that we've been washed clean and accepted by, our, by a holy God. And I think of John 3, 16. We all know that verse. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him 
what does it say? Should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now this redemption plan was Christ's assignment. That's why he was sent here. His assignment to come as a baby and that was that redemption plan. He completed that redemption plan with great love in his death and his resurrection. This Messiah that came as a child in a stable in Bethlehem paid the price not only for the sins of past generations, but the sins of present generations and all generations to come. He also promised that he has gone to prepare a place for us. In 1 John 40, 14 and verse 2, when he's talking to them, he said, there's more than enough room in my father's home. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? He promised it. We have that promise that with our salvation comes eternal life with him. All Jews and Gentiles can give glory to God for his enduring love and his eternal life. Another promise, you're never alone. Some people don't like being alone. Others really get energy from being alone, but I'm one of these people that doesn't like being alone very much. When I think about God's unconditional love for me and what it looks like, I think about companionship. When my heart is broken, God's there. And his heart breaks too for me. When no one else understands me, the creator of my very heart does. And he sends the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to help me. When I feel left out, isolated or rejected, I remember that Jesus went to the cross for me. Through his pain, he can understand my pain and love me whole again. Do you, do I, really understand the magnitude of God's promise to never leave you? In Psalm 2710, it said, the Bible proclaims that when, even if your father and your mother forsake you, the Lord will hold you close. You have a God and a father who's the eternal lover of your soul, and he's never going to abandon you. Even during 2020, God is beside us. We are never alone. Then God promises, to, God provides power and strength. Have you felt powerless in 2020? Last Thursday when we moved back to the orange, did you feel powerless? Does it feel like everything that matters in your life has been turned upside down? Do you listen to the COVID-19 updates and wonder, oh no, what will happen next? Do you wonder if you'll be able to survive through the next challenge? God is with you to provide power and strength in each challenge. In Philippians 4.13, we're given the promise, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God will never call us to a place and leave us unattended. You have a living hope, a promise, that God is with you through all of life's events even 2020, even COVID-19. Romans 8.31 reminds us, if God is for you, who can be against you? When we hope in God, he gives us strength to face the challenges of life with him on our side. We're also blessed, greatly blessed, I think, because God has given us family, friends, and a church family to walk with us through this uncertain time. We need to give glory to God for the power and strength that he gives us and the people he puts around us. That is his mercy that he's given to us. Promise number five, because God is in your life, hope is always alive in you. Now, as Christians, we're not immune to loss or to hurt or to pr in our personal life. We lose loved ones. We lose jobs. We're misunderstood. We're sick. We're tired of this pandemic, and the list goes on. But when you're tempted to lose hope, remember another scripture promise in Psalm 126.5. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. I'm not sure how we're going to reap with songs of joy when this pandemic is over, but I'm waiting to see how it happens. Jesus reminds us that he's with us no matter how dire the situation, even death does not have the last word. Hope can work powerfully in our lives. This gives us a good reason to praise God and remain full of hope. We have these hope muscles and we need to be flexing them. 
Now, during COVID-19, God is with us. He's hearing our prayers. But not only is he hearing our prayers, he's answering our prayers. We're not perfect. Our church is not perfect. But because of the grace of Jesus Christ, our hands can become his hands. Our feet can become his feet. And our love can allow someone else to see the face of God. Remember what we read earlier in Romans 15, 9? He also came so that the Gentiles might give glory to God for his mercies to them. Are we giving glory to God in COVID-19? Or are we too busy complaining? As we begin this Advent season, I think it's a good time to remember the hope of the Savior. Let's remember to share that hope with the world around us. In Romans 15, 13, we are reminded, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. My prayer for us is that our, that our joy will overflow with confident hope. God is with us. He's our hope. And we just need to ask him each day to fill us with that hope. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you are the hope. We thank you that we can, the promises you make to us, you always fulfill. We're thankful that you always love us. Especially, Lord, at this time, we just pray that you would help us in this COVID time to be your hands and feet, to be the Gentiles that are praising you because of your mercies. You've given us great mercies, Lord. We pray that we would just remember those mercies, that we would spend time with you, and we would be your hands and feet, praising and glorifying you to the world around us cause of your mercy to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. of you online my name is Tanya and I'm one of the elders of the church and this morning um, we're going to come together in prayer as a congregation we have many prayers and thank you Sheila so much for that message of hope I, I think it was a, a really strong message that we all need to hear today to, uh, to fill us with hope as we enter into the Advent season can we just bow our heads in prayer Lord we come to you this morning with very thankful hearts even in this time when people are are feeling hopeless, we have many things to thank you for. We thank you, Lord, for the area in which we live, for being in rural New Brunswick, for uh, keeping our COVID numbers fairly low. We thank you for being able to be here this morning, Lord, in, in your presence in this church and online, even though we are in, in orange zone. We thank you that we can still be here to worship. We thank you, Lord, at this time for all the many people who are caring for us on a daily basis, our health care workers, not only in our hospitals, but also in our villa, villa and our manors. Lord, we are very grateful knowing that the prayers that we have brought to you before have been heard and that you are working in the, love, in the lives of those people that we know from our community and within our congregation. We thank you, Lord for being there to comfort them in their time of health needs. We think of Anita Finnamore's brother, Paul. We think of Jack at the uh, Victoria Glen Manor. We remember Trisha's stepbrother, Cody. Marlene Foster's friend, Brian. We remember Marina Christofferson and Mary O'Neill, who are both in hospital. We thank you for these prayers for Sheila, sister Carolyn, for Jen Hansen and her husband, Derek, for Wayne and Sue Forbes, for Tammy Bragna's brother, James. We thank you, Lord, for Aaron, 
We thank you, Lord, for all that you are doing for these people, for the hope that you're giving them during very difficult times in their lives when they're dealing with sickness and illness and fear. We thank, thank you, Lord, for Ruth, Ruth Murphy, and we pray for continued um, healing in her as she's recovering from surgery. We also remember this morning Lord Alan Spencer's family members who are very ill. We ask you, Lord, to be with that entire family as they struggle with this illness and just to uh, lay your hand on them. Those who are waiting for surgery, Lord, are finding this very difficult, and we pray, God, that you will just give them hope and help with their anxiety. And we remember Adam Corbett, Julie Brayson's um, friend's mom, Jocelyn Green, and Andrew Dreyer. Lord, we pray for Sue Sprague's niece who is in the Fredericton Hospital. May you be with her, Lord, at this time. Comfort her and bring her healing. Lord, we think of all those people who are grieving. There are many within our community, Lord, and also within our grief share. We thank you, Lord, for that ministry of this church, for the people who share in that ministry, and we pray, God, for healing for those who are attending. Lord, we thank you for our church ministries. We thank you especially, Lord, for this past weekend and all the work that went into the children's ministry to provide an, an online caroling service uh, for the people of the Villa and the Manor. We thank you, Lord, for the people that work so hard in that, for Sabrina and, and Kat and Michael and Sheila. And we're just really thankful, Lord, to have those people in, in our church. We thank you for our other ministries too, Lord, and we pray for all the volunteers that you will continue to help them to work hard and want to work and to be here and, and to keep giving of their time and their love for each other and for our community and for our church. And Lord, we have so many prayers around the COVID that I could stay here all day, but I know, God, that you're listening. And so, Lord, mostly we pray for the sick and the infected. God, help them, heal them, sustain bodies and spirits, and contain the spread of this infection, Lord. We pray, Lord, for our most vulnerable populations. Protect our elderly, protect our poor, protect those who are suffering from chronic disease. Lord, we pray for our young people. Soften their hearts, make them be aware of all of the rules that they need to keep in order to keep themselves and everyone else around them healthy. Lord, we pray for our Christian missionaries who are working around the world in extremely uncertain times, and they're in a vulnerable situation anyway. And we just pray, God, for your love to them and that you will give them hope and that you will just guide them in their ministries. And Lord, we pray for us and for all Christians in every neighborhood and for all the people in our neighborhoods and communities and cities. May your Holy Spirit inspire us to pray, to give, to love, to serve, and to proclaim the gospel that the name of Jesus Christ might be glorified around the world. And Lord, we pray especially this morning for all of those people in the frontline workers in our hospitals, villas, manors. Give them patience, Lord, give them strength, Give them courage. They are loving, kind people. It's why they do what they do. It's why they got into the profession they got into. They want to serve. They want to help. We just pray, Lord, that you'll give them the strength that they need to endure during this difficult time. And Lord, we also pray for all those prayers that are in people's hearts that haven't come forward this morning. You know what they are, God. May you bless each and every person who has a need May they know that you are our God who gives us hope and love and that you never leave us. You are here during those difficult times. We just have to look to you for help. In this I pray, Lord. Amen.
We'll ask you to stand for this last song. You can stretch your legs for a moment. Christian hope is a confidence that something will come to pass because God has promised it will come to pass. As you go this week, know that the God of promises is with you. Know that when God makes a promise, he keeps that promise. And this same God promises to love you unconditionally, to prepare a home for you, and to be with you always. May these promises give birth to hope not a hope that is wishful thinking, but a hope that is rooted in the fulfillment of God's promises in the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>